but I'm giving a lecture in the EKG radiology pharmacology toxicology lecture series this morning. I'm not telling you what my topic is yet until we get through the case and then hopefully you figure it out. Um, I'm going to try to cover all of those things in the span of about like 25 minutes. So wish me luck. Um, let's start with the case. We have a 29 year old man with no medical history. He comes into your ED with fever times one day with just some kind of viral symptoms, maybe vague generalized abdominal pain. This is what you have on your exam. He has a fever of 101.1 with tachycardia kind of appropriate for that temperature, otherwise normal vital signs. And on exam, he has a little bit of right upper quadrant tenderness and jaundice and mild splenomegaly, but otherwise you don't really see much of anything else that's concerning. So I guess for some of the junior residents, is there anything specifically that we should be asking this patient or doing on our exam or testing for? Alcohol use, good. So this patient doesn't really have alcohol use or drug use. Travel, good. So that's a really, really important one. And we can move right into the point of this talk, which is to talk about fever in a traveler. This is actually me, obviously. Um, I went to Ecuador after my first year of medical school. I took malaria prophylaxis. I totally made this case up. Um, I did not get malaria, although I did get a parasite, although that's a little bit like outside of the scope of this lecture. Um, basically, the point is that anytime you have a fever, especially in the middle of a viral pandemic, a lot of us have been kind of anchoring and saying this patient has COVID, but you have to have to ask about the travel history because it totally changes your differential diagnosis. You have to include the normal things like UTIs and pneumonia. Um, it's great to ask about substance use, sexual history, but you also have to include a lot of these quote unquote tropical diseases like malaria, dengue fever, Zika virus, West Nile virus, leptospirosis. There are a lot of different things that we can include. So today we're talking about malaria. So these are our objectives. We're gonna briefly talk about the epidemiology and pathophysiology. We're gonna review a couple of options for prophylaxis, which we may or may not really need to know in the emergency department. And then we're gonna review kind of the spectrum of disease of malaria. So if there's nothing else that you really take away from this lecture, the most important objective is number three, because malaria is a spectrum, which I actually didn't know. And I guess before we move into the rest of the lecture, I would like to thank in particular, Dr. Wiener, Dr. Tang, Dr. Gopal with their, for their help with this lecture. Um, the life cycle of malaria is not necessarily something that you need to memorize. I'm sure a lot of us saw some diagram like this in medical school, but just to briefly review, you get bitten by a mosquito that has the malaria parasite within it. They inject the parasite into your bloodstream and it goes to the liver as the sporozoite. And when it's there, it basically replicates and then eventually the liver cells burst. Once it does that, the merozoites are the ones that kind of move into the red blood cells and then it replicates within the red blood cells and you get kind of a cycle of hemolysis when they rupture and release the gametocytes that are picked up by further mosquito bites. So again, maybe not super important for an emergency medicine physician, but it is kind of interesting to me because the, the, the hemolysis, the cycles of hemolysis that you get kind of in my head at least correspond to the cyclic fever that's kind of classic for malaria. So this is a map from the CDC. These are a lot of the endemic areas of malaria. So you can see it's mostly Central and South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, um, and actually it's getting better. So this is from The Economist. It used to be really bad, like everywhere. And now as we move into 2020, you can see the map is much better. Um, and hopefully the projection is that we can try to mostly get rid of it by 2040. Although I will mention that COVID has actually made malaria a lot worse. It's actually made a lot of things worse, but in particular for malaria, the WHO was very concerned that there would be a lot of like excess deaths related to malaria. So partially that's because 
a lot of countries, maybe throughout like sub-Saharan Africa, have campaigns where they kind of pass out insecticide treated nets to people. And those got disrupted by the COVID pandemic. And so they actually saw over 350,000 quote unquote extra or excess deaths from malaria in 2020. And again, it's an important consideration for a lot of our patients. We have a lot of people who just live in Brooklyn, but a lot of people travel even in the middle of a pandemic or they are visiting from somewhere outside of the United States. So if you don't know, that's fine. As long as you ask about the travel history, you can look on the CDC website by country and it will tell you some of the information about malaria, whether or not it's endemic and what you might wanna to use to treat. So let's move into prophylaxis. This is a little bit difficult to see, so I'll go over some of the highlights. Uh, this is from American Family Physician. Usually there's like three common prophylaxis medications. So you can do uh, malarone, which is what I took, which is the Atovaquone Proguanil. You can do doxycycline. You can do mefloquin. Um, I highlighted also chloroquine in, this, in the, the bottom one there. Uh, that used to be favored, but it's not really favored as much because there's a lot of resistance actually now to plasmodium uh, within plasmodium falciparum to chloroquine. So you have to be careful, although it's still okay for some areas in the Middle East and some areas like Haiti and the Dominican Republic actually. Um, so for malarone at the top, that one's great because really you can start it like two days before you go and then you just take it every day and you take it for like a week after you get back from the place where the malaria is endemic. Malarone, you do have to know the person's kidney function because if they have decreased creatinine clearance, technically you should avoid malarone. Um, mefloquine would be a good option for patients who couldn't take malarone or who, um, are going somewhere where there's resistance to that. Mefloquine, the issue with that one is that it can prolong your QT interval, cause bradycardia, actually can also cause some really bizarre hallucinations and like neuropsychiatric side effects. So I don't know that that would be my go-to <laughs> prophylaxis for malaria. Um, doxycycline we're mostly familiar with. That one has the added benefit of prevention against tick-borne illnesses. So if you're going somewhere where that could be an issue too, that could be a good option. Doxycycline though, the most important thing to remember is that uh, you cannot give it to kids younger than eight. You have to stay away from doxycycline. So are there questions about prophylaxis at this point? Okay. So, Again, we're trying to cover EKG, radiology, pharmacology, toxicology. So we're gonna to get to some of that stuff. Um, I wanted to briefly do pharmacology just because malarone's kind of interesting. The development started in the 1960s, kind of after World War II, there was like a shortage of these quinone class medications and they were studying malaria within ducks. They developed lapinone and then later, like 20 years later, developed atovaquone which is what's in malarone that actually has activity in monkeys against plasmodium falciparum. And it works by, within the parasite mitochondria, it actually blocks the electron transport chain. So that's good because it's gonna hit both the liver and the red blood cell life stages. So it would be good prophylaxis. This is chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. The reason I'm bringing this up is because Everybody was trying to take hydroxychloroquine for a while, and we were actually giving it to people in the ICU like last year. Um, this hydroxychloroquine in particular, there were a lot of extra cases of toxicity reported to the poison control centers across the country because of the pandemic. Um, a toxic dose might be 10 milligrams per kilogram where a lethal dose would be like 30 milligrams per kilogram or three grams maybe. Um, just to review how it works, I'm sure this is bringing back a lot of flashbacks for people, uh, but it's important for particularly chloroquine because it functions as a sodium channel blockade. So if we think of 
our four phases of the cardiac action potential. Remember that phase four is kind of your resting where you have potassium channels open. And then phase zero is your rapid depolarization. So you get a rapid influx of sodium. And then phase one is potassium again. Phase two would be calcium and phase three is potassium. So roughly that corresponds to your EKG. Um, phase one, the rapid depolarization roughly corresponds to your QRS interval. And so if you have a medication that functions as a sodium channel blockade, doing something like that to the action potential, it's gonna prolong your QRS interval. Actually, it could also prolong your PR. And then if we think of potassium within this action potential, maybe phase three, that's gonna roughly correspond to your QT interval. So potentially hypokalemia causes prolonged QT. Um, this is an EKG that you may see in somebody who is taking certain medications. Could one of the juniors um, try to read this EKG for me, please? I'm not afraid to call on somebody. <laughs> How about Jamie? <laughs> Good. So that's a really good place to start. So absolutely, the QRS is wide. And I agree that it's really difficult to make out whether or not there are P waves. Some In lead three, I'm kind of like, maybe there's a P wave right before that QRS. But one of the most important things to take away from this, like you said, is that the QRS is wide. And then there's one other thing here, which is in AVR, we see what's called a terminal R. That's very kind of pathognomonic for being on a tricyclic. The purpose of this EKG is just to demonstrate what you might see with a sodium channel blockade. Not that this is specific to chloroquine, but if somebody had this EKG and you know that they're taking a sodium channel blocker or a tricyclic, which also has sodium channel blockade, what do you want to treat with? Sodium bicarb, good. Thank you. Sodium bicarb would be your treatment to kind of narrow that QRS. So chloroquine, again, is a really dirty medication, has sodium channel blockade, potassium blockade, and alpha blockade. So in addition to the potentially seizures that you can get with sodium channel blockade, you're going to get hypokalemia and potentially hypoglycemia, which is related to the potassium channel blockade that I will explain in just a second. Um, you can get hypotension from the alpha blockade, and then you can also have some hearing loss. So if we remember, the there's one study which I brought up a morning report maybe a couple of months ago that's by Baynert et al. It's from the 70s, I think the 70s. Basically, they studied tricyclic overdoses, which is a sodium channel blockade, and compared the QRS duration to mortality and seizures. So they actually used a cutoff of 100 milliseconds for the QRS. So that's why anything above 100 in a sort of toxicology EKG would be a technically prolonged QRS and would potentially require treatment with sodium bicarbonate. And actually that works, not necessarily because of the bicarb, but because the sodium is in there. It's kind of functioning as a hypertonic saline bolus to overcome the sodium channel blockade. So this is how chloroquine causes um, hypoglycemia. So this is the pancreas, um, the beta cells. And basically, if you block the potassium channels, you're going to get influx of calcium that causes insulin release. Uh, um, that uh, would cause very uh, profound and refractory hypoglycemia. So what do we do to treat this? We kind of already mentioned bicarbonate. And then like all patients that were resuscitating, we do IVO2 monitor, ABCs. 
Um, you want to control the airway early because there's a high aspiration risk when these patients maybe are having seizures. Um, there also um, is potentially some evidence for diazepam. Um, it was mostly animal studies, but they thought that diazepam had a cardioprotective function in patients that were taking sodium channel blockade. Um, just one tidbit would be, because we know it's a potassium channel blocker, I would probably avoid succinylcholine just because of the rapid shifting. So let's get back to malaria. Now that we've covered EKG, toxicology, and pharmacology, we can go back. <laughs> so malaria is a spectrum. That is the most important thing that you can take away from this lecture. It can be basically anything from like a quote unquote benign fever with viral type symptoms all the way to multi-organ failure. So under the severe category here, you can see hemolytic anemia and DIC in particular is a very severe form of malaria. You can also get cerebral malaria, renal failure, ARDS, and then it has um, parasitemia as one of the indications. I don't know that we're gonna be the one to kind of diagnose that, but we can at least keep an eye out for anything on the spectrum of badness that is gonna point us toward a severe form of malaria. And you have to be comfortable calling ID as soon as possible. Basically in any fever traveler, I would probably call ID. Um, be comfortable calling the ICU. Like if you have a diagnosis of malaria already and you have these features, just call them because it's better to have them on board even if the patient winds up on the floor. So in our workup, we can see kind of any variation of some of those things that we mentioned on the previous slide. So renal failure, liver failure, hemolytic anemia, DIC. But there's a couple of other things that are not really specific for those. Um, hyponatremia and hypoglycemia can be seen. And then I wanted to briefly talk about smears just because you should definitely order the smear. That's the only way you're gonna figure this out. There's thick and thin smears. And so thick is basically just a drop of blood on a slide that's used for basically determining if parasites are present. And then the thin smear is kind of spread over a very large area of the slide. And that's for determining like which specific parasite it is. So our lab actually uses a purple top tube where they run the CBC, which is okay, but it's not ideal because really capillary blood has the highest parasite burden. And so we should be doing it ourselves with the finger stick. Um, sometimes if the CBC has a ton of malaria in it, you might see it just reported in the differential that they see plasmodium, but that's not that common. So cerebral malaria is one kind of hallmark severe malaria. Um, really the biggest thing is depression of mental status. Um, we don't really know why this happens. It's thought maybe it kind of affects the cytokine pathways, damages the endothelium or breaks down the blood, blood, sorry, blood brain barrier, but nobody really knows. Um, most importantly, you have to exclude kind of other causes for um, altered mental status and fever. So you have to do an LP um, because there was one study from Malawi few years ago that was saying like 25% of these patients actually have another identifiable cause for their change in mental status. And then here, this study, um, it's from the, it's a systematic review from Cochrane, basically studying anticonvulsants for cerebral malaria, particularly phenobarbital, which they found reduced seizure uh, frequency or duration, but didn't really affect mortality at all and people are now kind of studying Keppra. Um, basically the point is this is a really, really profound severe malaria. It's usually children, maybe after one to three days of fever, they develop seizures and then coma and then they die. For adults, it's kind of like, this would probably be part of multi-organ failure. So just to tie in radiology, cause I had to do all of it. Um, this is what you might see on an MRI for cerebral malaria. Not that you're going to do this from the ED, but I thought it was interesting. You can see hypothalamic infarcts or micro bleeding. 
this image is a um, DWI that basically has that attenuation in the corpus callosum, which is suggested from either edema or cytotoxic injury. The point is nothing's really gonna be specific for cerebral malaria. You just have to treat them. So how are we gonna treat them? Uh, to be honest, I never remember this stuff off the top of my head. And so if you don't know, that's why the CDC exists. So there's a hotline that you can just call or you can just Google malaria treatment CDC and they have a bunch of recommendations. Um, generally severe malaria will be IV artesanate. And then you kind of start that and give it until the parasite burden is less than 1%. Um, just an interesting tox point too, is that artesanate comes from wormwood, which is the same thing they use to make um, absinthe. Um, so just two, I wanna make sure we're on time. So just two um, quick kind of studies that were published this month or last month, I guess, cause it's September now. Um, the top one is from August 11th in the New England Journal and the bottom one is from August 25th in the New England Journal. And so the top one, without going into the details, basically in the top one, they gave people a monoclonal antibody against malaria as part of like a phase one trial and there were no safety concerns and it worked. And then the bottom one was an addition of a vaccine in, in combination with chemo prophylaxis that actually reduced mortality and morbidity um, far greater than one or the other alone. So, just to wrap up, did we accomplish these objectives? I hope so. Um, generally, again, remember Central South America and Africa and Southeast Asia. And if you don't know, just go to the CDC website. For prophylaxis, remember most commonly it's gonna be malarone, but if somebody's on mefloquine, beware of the QT prolongation and the neuropsychiatric side effects. We also spoke about chloroquine in particular as a sodium channel blockade. And then malaria is a spectrum. That's the most important from nothing basically to multi-organ failure. And if you have anything that indicates severe malaria, just call ID, call the ICU, start the IV artesanate. So back to our case, you correctly suspected malaria based on your travel history in this patient. But in the ED, you're not necessarily gonna make that diagnosis. And so you still have to do kind of like a full fever workup. You have to do the UA chest X-ray. For this patient, you're probably gonna get some kind of abdominal imaging because of the right upper quadrant tenderness and jaundice. You're gonna give empiric antibiotics and then you're gonna order the smear and you're just gonna admit this patient. If you had a diagnosis of malaria, technically this is probably severe malaria because of the splenomegaly, the jaundice. If you don't have that diagnosis and the person looks okay, I think it's reasonable to just admit them to the floor with your ID consultants on board so they can follow everything. So just remember to include this in your differential and to order the smear and call ID. That's it. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Overnight, Probably have to call push somebody to do it. Um, I don't say they actually send it.